Hi, everyone. I'm Sandy Marquardt Pyatt. Um, I've been co PI on the KBS LTR since 2016. I'm a sociologist by training and am currently professor of geography and political science at Michigan State University. I study how the environment shapes human perceptions and actions. So I'm really excited to be here today to uh, represent our site and provide some context about the social science work with, that we've been doing behind the scenes at KBS for a while. Uh, KBS is located in rural Southwest Michigan, surrounded by a diverse landscape. The agricultural landscape around KBS is representative of the US Corn Belt and Great Lakes region with a mosaic of croplands, successional forests, and lakes and wetlands. And as many of you know from your own experiences, being able to gather long-term data has amazing benefits. And as a social scientist, I'm incredibly excited to be able to discuss some of the uh, some of what we've been working on um, here at KBS. So uh, quick site news. So KBS has joined the uh, Long-Term Agroecosystem Research Network affiliated with USDA ARS, so the LTAR. We're still working on our acronyms. Um, and the, so that's why agroecosystem is on there, but we're still focused on the ecology of agricultural landscapes. And part of what I'm working on is building this long-term social science data collection that complements the 30 plus years of ecological work at, at the station. We started it in 2017 and we're very concerned about resolution and matching or connecting the social and the ecological within the themes of thinking about what other sites have talked about, this spatial and temporal variability. So to meet our goal of accounting for this spatial and temporal uh, variability in farmer decision-making and gathering information on resilience, which is one of our themes for, for our current grant, we're building a multi-state, multi-year mail survey of row crop farmers. Uh, in 2017, we initiated this long-term panel mail survey of farmers in the upper Midwest or Eastern Corn Belt. And annually, we send a self-administered mail survey to farmers in four states, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, and Ohio, as you can see here, um, to all of the counties that you see in, uh, not in grayscale in this. So we selected counties with at least 15% of the total land area, planted the corn or soybean in 2016, and farms that had planted more than 100 acres of corn or soybean in 2016. And our baseline questionnaire, was gathering information about management practices at the farm level and of one field planted to corn in 2016. So we asked this core set of questions every year about farm characteristics and farmer attributes, things like yield, productivity, and crop acres planted, things we could compare directly with, um, with our site, and farmer demographics like age, how long farmers have been the primary decision maker, and farm profitability, some of which we can compare, but not all of which we can compare with our site. And we include a range of topics linked with resources, diversity, and adaptation, given our um, theme on mechanisms of resilience. So wave one, we asked about stewardship practice adoption, information sources, farming values, environmental attitudes, very much um, linked with some of these social science baseline questions that we wanted. But we also had a concern with, um, with ecological questions like climate change, extreme weather, cover crops, um, and so on. We've also asked questions about soil health in our third wave, changing management practices, um, challenges to farming and changes in profitability. So we've introduced a lot of different questions, including risk management, opinions about trade wars, because again, social scientists here, um, thinking about precision ag practices as well. And we also have asked a series of questions about prairie strips, enrolling in conservation programs, uh, continuous no-till, and orientation about the future. So who are we talking about? Who's a typical farmer? Um, we're talking about farmers who are on average 61 years old, have been farming for roughly three decades and operate about 500 acres. And this is across the region. So we, when we're thinking about planning this, we have to think about um, representativeness of our sample, accounting for attrition in our panel and ensuring we can answer questions about resilience on an annual basis, as well as change over time. Now, building this longitudinal data set uh, requires what you see on this slide, which is basically the survey covers of all of the different waves of surveys that we've sent. So um, we began in the second year to collect data from two different groups from, to account for attrition in our panel. What this means is we have a return sample. If you look at just the, the survey covers across the top of the slide and a new sample of farmers along the bottom. Again, we included them given attrition. So each year we have roughly 2000 observations when we aggregate all four states. And this is shown uh, with each red box. 
So moving now to the purple box, this is showing how we've created a panel. And the, this helps us with uh, our cohort or longitudinal models. And the blue arrows are showing how the new sample from the previous wave is wrapped into our panel sample for the subsequent wave. So it's an unbalanced panel. It's ridiculous in terms of the total amount of paper and the total number of surveys that we currently have, but it's exciting. And we can also compare it to NAS data and ARMS data. So we decided to ask farmers about climate change and weather, knowing that there are some differences um, between the two in terms of how people are perceiving these. So focusing first um, on the red line, here we're talking about, um, here we can see that the percent of farmers saying that climate change is not happening, it's shown in red. And this is showing, showing uh, data for four years in our panel. So there is a change in terms of a decline from 17% in 2017, now to 9% of farmers who say the climate change is not happening. Well, what are farmers saying in terms of attribution of climate change? Note that the blue line is showing the percent of farmers who think that climate change is happening and it's caused equally by human activities and natural forces. The green line, it's happening and just natural forces. And the purple is showing that Farmer, the percentage of farmers thinking that, responding, excuse me, that climate change is happening and caused by human activities. So we also asked about weather. So farmers aren't necessarily thinking that climate change and weather and responding to both, both of those in the same way. So if we look now at the same colors that we're seeing here, but focus first on the top half of the, of the graphic on the right-hand side, note that what we see here is um, the perceptions of weather events differ. So thinking about um, heavy rain events, more extreme weather and rainy spring weather, those are shown by the blue, green and purple lines respectively. Those are hanging together and we see actually an increase between 2019 and 2020. Um, but looking at droughts, farmers are perceiving droughts very differently. And reasons for that are still undetermined, but what we can look at on the next slide may be giving us some detail about why. So it's motivating some ideas for future research. So thinking about extreme rain events and drought, for some farmers in terms of their practices, they're not changing anything. Farmers aren't changing their tillage, they're not changing their nitrogen application. Um, some though have indicated an increased use of drought tolerant crop varieties. Um, uh, almost, uh, actually more than a third are indicating increased use of cover crops during, um, during 2018 and 2019. And roughly half of farmers are putting in tile drainage given both wetter springs and extreme rain events. So farmers are responding to too much water and they're also responding to not enough water, but they're responding very differently. So you'll see the final here, uh, the, the final point here is that uh, farmers haven't, um, change their irrigated acres in response to drought. Only 15% have. What are we working on next? So I spend a lot of my time listening in many of our um, co-PI and PI meetings. And we're, what we're thinking about now as we're writing our next proposal is how are we gonna supplement, um, how does the data that we've gathered on farmers connect with some other human data, right? Future data on farmers and or some ecological data. So we're looking at topics aligning with our next proposal that are indicative of, of the research generally, thinking about soil health, regenerative agriculture, climate change, biodiversity, precision ag and technology. Why are farmers adopting some of these very different um, practices at the same time? And um, thinking more about not just understanding, but also moving into more prediction with some of these models. Thank you.